I'm Jennifer Smith. And I'm Melba Jones. And we, we are, are Women's Health in Black and White. And we kept Candace. We're not letting her leave. <laughs> We're not letting her leave. She, she stays up. forever now. Um, <laughs> We, we just did a, She doesn't know that yet, but we're not letting her get up. She's, she's our prisoner. Uh, we, we just did a video about infertility and how it is diagnosed and how you, what you do to find out what's going on and how you start the assessment process. Mm -hmm. And Candace is going to walk us through how to treat it, how to get pregnant when you know that you've got an infertility problem. Right. So there's ovarian reserve and all the other things that we talked about, you know, helps to guide the specialist or even your provider in your OBGYN office. It helps guide them in what direction you need to go in as far as management. Um, if when you have a lower ovarian reserve, you know, you want to go the route of, you know, IVF and all that. And we're going to talk about that in a minute. But, you know, sometimes if you just have just some, your ovulation is off, you know, irregular cycles, you can do something as simple as taking ovulation medications, mm -hmm. oral ovulation medications. Um, the two that are typically prescribed, one is more, you know, old school, has been around for a long time, Clomid, I'm sure most mm -hmm. everyone has heard of Clomid. Yeah. Um, I typically don't use that one just because it causes a lot of side effects, like mood changes on hot flashes, and the significant others hate <laughs> it because of the mood changes. Like, you don't get pregnant because your spouse yeah, hates it. Absolutely. Right. So, but also, I mean, it stays in your system longer than letrozole does, and so it could potentially it could potentially cause issues with, you know, birth defects and stuff. But it also, you know, it just, like I said, it causes, like, hot flashes, night sweats, mood mm -hmm. changes, and all that. So it's just, it's not one that I like to prescribe. And, I mean, if patients want to try it, sometimes I will do that. But I typically start with letrozole. It's actually a breast cancer medication. Um, it, it suppresses estrogen down. And, let me make long story short, it, it basically, it helps you to produce more follicles than you normally would with a regular cycle um, and so you could get two to three follicles that start to grow but sometimes what will happen in patients with like PCOS and some resistance stuff like that what will happen is those follicles will kind of just stall out or just go away they don't ever get to a point of ovulation with those and so and of course in my experience tracking those with multiple ultrasounds and stuff you see that and so at that point, you know, or if someone has a lower ovarian reserve, you can try injections with the oral medications. And so typically what I say is with the oral medicine, it gets those follicles started, but the injections are like fertilizer for those, those follicles. And so it helps to keep them growing. But therefore, I mean, because of that, you run the risk of, of having multiple follicles. So it's really important to track those follicles because you don't want to overstimulate and you don't want someone who's 25 producing four or five good follicles because they could potentially get pregnant with that many. And then there's so many other complications that can happen with that. So it's not something to take lightly either. And so, you know, that should be monitored really closely by someone who knows what they're doing. You know, typically a reproductive endocrinologist. Um, then, you know, there's two, di there's, there's different ways you there's multiple days you can t do it there you could do injections like two or three days i mean you could do, for someone who has a lower ovarian reserve a lot of times they'll do more of a, a mega stimulation cycle where they're doing like five or more days of injections and it all depends on what how's that patient responding you know you follow them every day every other day and then kind of see you know typically follicles will grow about one to two um, millimeters a day um, centimeters a day, sorry. <laughs> <laughs> or is it millimeters? I don't remember. Anyway. Yeah, it's one of them. It's one of them. It's one that grow just a little yeah. bit every day. Yeah. Right. Yeah. <laughs> That's all you need to know. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> it's millimeters. There you go. Okay. The <laughs> nurse is not mad. Yeah. Sorry. Absolutely. <laughs> I can measure a follicle all day long. Like, I know what I'm doing there. But anyway, they'll typically, but everyone actually, they'll grow differently. So you have to, I mean, as you see them, um, if they are there for multiple rounds, you can learn how their body responds yeah. to it and everything. And so you just kind of titrate it based on their body and everything. But then at that point with, with electrozole, you know, if you're with a reproductive endocrinology group, um, they'll do a trigger shot, which actually it helps to narrow down ovulation better. So it's, it's just, it, you can time intercourse better or do um, insemination. Um, so that, you know, sometimes patients will opt to do opt to do insemination just to help increase their fertility rate or pregnancy rates a little bit more or but because they have to do that because there's a sperm issue. Mm. So, um, and that would, again, um, you'd have to do that in reproductive endocrinology office and they 
spin the sperm down and the, the good, the best of the best comes to the top. Mmm. Oh, yes. That's what they inject in the uterus, so it just gets it closer to that egg. Um, and then also the um, IVF is kind of the next step after that is in vitro fertilization. Um, basically, you just you start injections early on in your cycle and um, like two or three days after you start your period, you just start doing injections. You're trying to recruit as many eggs as possible um, to get good embryos um, for, uh, for a transfer. So, and none of this is comfortable, by the way. No, absolutely not. But it's definitely <laughs> worth it, but it's definitely not comfortable. Um, so, IVF is the step up. And then you have those patients who have, you know, they're menopausal, they're young, you know, it's early menopause, um, or they're just, they're older and the egg quality is just not there because of mm -hmm. age. And a lot of times the best option is donor egg. And, you know, you see a lot of these celebrities are 50 plus having babies and infertility patients get really worked up about that because I've been there. I know I used to get so angry about it and I'm like, how are they getting pregnant? Yeah. Yeah. And then what I didn't realize until I started working in infertility is that it's because I use donor egg and donor egg is they're using an egg of someone who's a lot younger that has, you know, better egg quality and um, pregnancy rates are better. Now that doesn't mean that they're not going to have issues with blood pressure issues right. or gestation diabetes and stuff like that, but their pregnancy rates are better. Um, so donor egg is always an option too, you know, and sometimes when you get to that point, a lot of times you're thinking adoption or donor egg and, you know, everyone has a different path again. So, right. you know, some people don't want to do that and they opt to do the adoption route, which is great too. So, um, but that's kind of like when I'm talking to patients, that's kind of, if they're in that, you know, their ovarian reserve is really low mm -hmm. and all right. that and then that's kind of like okay this is this is the point where you are and it's like okay you've got to decide do you want to go the donor egg route or do you want to go the adoption route yeah. and so you know everybody mm -hmm. gets there when they get there so but that's typically you know it all depends on the patient and what is um their situation and kind of what they feel comfortable with and some people typically will do three or four rounds of each thing before progressing to the next right. step but some patients are like, I wanted to be pregnant yesterday, and so they offer the IVF route. So just everyone's different. So. And it, I, you know, I hate to be crass and talk about money, but it's a, it's a big deal. It is. Uh, insurance yeah. companies may pay for a round of in vitro, but mine didn't. I, we had to pay no, for it all yeah. out of pocket. So it can be very, very expensive when right. you go this route. Um, so if you think that this is a possibility, I would recommend a savings plan mm -hmm. as early as possible. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. <laughs> Yeah, absolutely. And that's, I mean, that's about it on how to, the different types of medications and everything. If you have any questions about in vitro fertilization, uh, artificial insemination, any of the medications, if you're going through the process right now and you really want to talk to somebody, make an appointment with your healthcare provider. But right. if you have a non-specific question, you can send it to us <laughs> on Facebook or um, Instagram, Instagram, Twitter. Twitter. Uh, you can follow us on our podcast, Afterglow. And... Um, Stay tuned because we've got a lot more good stuff coming up.